Hi everyone and welcome to the News Agent Podcast. I'm Susie Lysett, Content Manager at Goodlord. The Renters Reform Bill has landed and this podcast episode is a recording of our latest webinar going through just what it all means from what's included in the bill to the expected timelines for its implementation. Goodlord's Director of Insurance, Ollie Sherlock and Ryan Heaven, Solicitor at Dutton Gregory, are the experts that will be taking us through the detail. So without any further ado, on with the podcast. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Good Lord webinar. We are here today joined by Ryan Heaven from Dustin Gregory. He's going to be joining us shortly. My name is Ollie Sherlock. I'm Director of Insurance here at Good Lord, and we'll be walking you through the latest update on the Renters Reform Bill. Of course, uh, the bill broke ground last week, um, and there's plenty to discuss. 89 pages, in fact. Uh, we're not going to take you through every single page line by line. We're going to try and simplify it for you and t- talk you through exactly what the bill um, is intending, um, the potential effects of the bill, and also um, everything in between in terms of um, what challenges the bill presents, uh, but also the things that we think you know could be challenged um, throughout this process. So of course, this is uh, the very start, uh, frankly, of the bill going through the process to become enacted in law. Um, today is, of course, about the Renters Reform Bill. Um, but to remind you, uh, if you don't already know who Good Lord are, Good Lord are a pre-tenancy uh, business. We simplify the pre-tenancy process and allow you to focus on other things within your lettings business above and beyond the administration of that pre-tenancy. Along with that, we also generate revenue for you as a lettings customer too, through simple things like rent protection insurance, for example. There's other developments within the system that you may not be aware of, things like rent collection, landlords terms of business. We're now automating and delivering more of that journey to our customers than ever before. If you want to know more about Good Lord, then please do visit our website at www.goodlord.co. As I say, though, this is not a pitch for Good Lord. These sessions often aren't, frankly. That isn't what really what we're here to do. And we're here to guide you through the Renters Reform Bill and give you some up-to-date uh, insights from a legal uh, perspective and also take any of your questions. Um, a question already in from, from Hez. Good morning, Hez. How long is the session going to be? Um, the session is scheduled for an hour uh, this morning. Um, we we reserve the right to overrun if indeed there's there's questions coming in, but we're going to try and try and condense it down to, to the hour the best we possibly can. Very much led by by yourselves. Right, let's get into it. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Ali. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you this morning? Yeah, not bad at all. I'm sat in Good Lord's office this morning. Um, I've met the office dog, so the, the day's gone as well as it can be so far. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Ryan, it would be really great if you just give a little bit of background yourself, please, and talk us through sort of who you are, what, what you do um, in your position at Dutton Gregory. Great. Thanks, Ollie. Um, some of you may be familiar with, with Dutton Gregory, but if not, we are perhaps most famously known for operating Property Marks Legal Helpline. Some of you may be members, and if my voice is at all familiar, we may well, we may well have spoken before. Um, I've been working in Landlord Tent for the last eight years, and um, in that time, I've worked with Good Lord on their um, AST and their Welsh contracts and also their terms of business. So again, if you're using any of the documents provided by Good Lord, my, uh, my fingerprints might be all over that. Um, and yeah, generally speaking, I, I do a little bit, bit mixture of um, advice work, um, possession claims, and document drafting. So a bit of all all fields in uh, in in that respect. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the, we're going to try and get in as much detail as we can today. Um, there will be plenty uh, of, of sessions around opinion. Uh, we're going to have some opinion blended in, of course, but there'll be plenty of sessions with with, with opinion, uh, with suggestions. Um, what we want to try and do, especially in the first phase of today's webinar, is get into the detail and get from a legal perspective exactly what the bill is intending to do and what it's suggesting it's going to do, which is why I think Ryan is, is such a suitable candidate to come and join us this morning. So again, once again, Ryan, thank you for your time. Um, let's look at the agenda. Let's look at what we're going to be discussing through today. So first of all, um, we're going to be looking at uh, exactly um, what the uh, the bill has um, proposed, we, what, what's in there. Um, we're going to look at the ex- expected timeline for its implementation. We are now into a structured timeline. Um, gone are the days of sort of twiddling our thumbs, waiting for the government to tell us something. Uh, we kind of know the structure in which it's going to operate. Um, that doesn't suggest that we know exactly the timing of it, but we know the structure. Um there's also lessons to take from uh, our counterparts in Scotland and Wales that are arguably, from a legislative perspective, a bit further ahead than we are. And there's some um, some, some sort of comparisons there um, that Ryan's going to talk us through. And of course, we have the live Q&A um, at the end. Um, so let's start by talking about the bill. Um, 
Interestingly, we've got a comment from Mandy. Good morning, Mandy. I hope you're well. Uh, it says, I feel like we've gone back to the 80s with some of the legislation. Well, interestingly, Mandy, of course, the last the last legislative change um, was, what, 1988, I think, the 1988 Housing Act, uh, which was obviously brought in, Ryan, um, to try and help um, support growth and incentivize the, 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 the market, because at that stage, of course, the, the lettings uh, world was, one, extremely small compared to where it is now, but two, far more controlled in the legislative powers that were there. Um, so I, I I somewhat see where Mandy's going, but um, I, I would suggest that we're not going that far back or that restrictive. Um, but let, let, let's let the guys make their own minds up here. Talk us through, um, you know, what the bill's proposing here, because it's 89 pages. There's a lot of detail in there, isn't there? Can you sort of cut through some of that for us and talk us through the headlines of what, what our attendees today should be, be focusing on? Well, I think most people are well aware of what the main headline is, and that is to do with Section 21 being scrapped. Um, what I want to focus on today is mostly about the mechanics of how the law operates. So we've all had a lot of a lot of time to go through the white paper and digest that. Um, and so to an extent, we knew what was coming. What we didn't know was exactly how the law would would come into effect. So the mechanics of the operation there. So from, uh, from the perspective of Section 21 being banned, there's actually not very much to talk about. Uh, they told us they were going to ban them. They have banned them. Um, that 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 more or less ends uh, this this section of the webinar, section twenty ones, as far as as far as I'm concerned. Um, the, the 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 more interesting thing for me, at least, is uh, the new grounds that are coming in to solidify section eight because we only had broad intentions about what those grounds might be. They've been fleshed out a little bit more here. Um, and then we also were promised things which haven't really come to fruition yet, um, such as the uh, the landlords register. Um, and then we've also got things which never made it into familiar at, at all, but we'll save that for uh, for slightly later on. Um, if, if you, I think we'll probably come to it, but um, we're, we'll go through it more or less line by line. Um, I've read the entire thing. Um, I, I will say 89 pages is a long old read, but luckily a lot of it is to do with uh, social housing, which I think for the purposes of, of the people on this webinar is irrelevant. So that that pretty much slices it in half. Um, and then there is a very long and wordy section towards the end, which really is only interest uh, to lawyers or uh, geeks, for want of a better word. <laughs> um, it's all about implementation and, and, and how the law is actually going to come into effect. But that's not something you need to worry about now because we are a long way away from knowing the certain dates of anything here. Um, as Ollie alluded to, we we can estimate when the bill is going to be passed to make it into legislation, but it doesn't mean the law is going to kick in the very next day. Uh, we've got lots of relevant dates for this legislation, and um, we don't know any of them at the moment. So we'll just have to give our, our, our best guesses as to when those things are likely to be. Fantastic. So in terms of um, wearing your, your letting agents hats, Ryan, there's going to be certain things that that, that, that are changing. Um, you, I think you've, you, you're absolutely spot on in terms of your assessment of Section 21. We knew that was going to happen. It's happening. Um, and actually, the, the conversation should now focus predominantly more on Section 8, frankly, and, and understanding what the, the framework is within Section 8 um, that, that agents and animals can utilise. I suppose the biggest um, the biggest move here um, is the um, move away from a short short hold tenancies, right, into a short tenancy if you're a letting agent. That's the first sort of um, headline grabber, I, I would argue. Can you talk us through what that looks like, um, the suggestion there, but also the retrospective um, action that the bill is, is suggesting that will need to be taken to align, uh, frankly, all tenancies um, onto an assured tenancy? Yeah, I, I can't remember who asked the question, but they referenced things going back to the 80s. Um, it, it, I mean, the, the terminology is there. We're going back to assured tenancies rather than assured short holds. We've had ASTs since 1996, um, uh, and I was in primary school then. Um, so we've had a fair old time to, uh, to to be familiar with ASTs, but assured tenancies is what we had before then. Um in many ways, we are going back to that, but there are differences between now and then. The main difference would be all of the extra regulation that's come in since the Housing Act was implemented in 1988. Um, so registering deposits in the schemes, um, EICRs, things like that, and HMO regulations. Um, that continues to apply, and that was something you simply didn't have to worry about in the, in the 90s. Um, what we do have now that's better for the landlord is these new grounds so um the 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 grounds one and two sorry grounds one and one a will be a particular interest to people um and to landlords so it's not quite the same as going back even though the terminology is is obviously a bit of a throwback to those times 
And and in terms of the um, the retrospective piece, there's clear timelines I think set out within the bill um, in terms of what they're what, well I say the, the suggestive timelines um, uh, set out in terms of, of of what is being asked to to, to to be completed by by letting agents and landlords. So as of a set date to be determined, um, tenancies will, will will the tenancies utilized um will be assured tenancies but of course all other tenancies that are currently on assured short hold tenancies will have retrospective action just remind us of those time frames and what the bill is suggesting ryan because i think this i think it's important to note and we'll probably visit this a couple of times that as attendees you may be focusing on when does this come into power there's already been some questions on you know when can we when we will not be able to serve section 21 in england uh, i would suggest that's probably going to be the date the law is passed it's probably like the easiest one to to essentially say this is in place from this date but i think it's really key to understand that a lot of what the bill is proposing especially with some of the things that aren't included in the bill but have been mentioned and promised by the government i.e., the decent home standard for example they will be introduced over time and I think it's really important to understand exactly what's coming down the tracks and, pro- and and plan accordingly for that, because it's not all going to hit at once, is it, Ryan? It's going to be it's going to be measured across a period of time. And from a, a tenancy perspective, one of the points in the bill is that there will be retrospective action to align tenancies. Can you just talk us through the actual timeframes there that the bill is suggesting? Yeah, so you're quite right. And, and in fact, probably the least relevant date is when the law actually passes through Parliament. Um, the, the bill provides for two dates in terms of um, in terms of the law coming into effect. And this will be familiar to people who remember uh, the Tenant Fee Act coming into force. Um, this is how it, they tend to do these things. You have an application date. What that means is Parliament or rather the Secretary of State will set a date at which the Act will come into force. Um, that's obviously to be determined. We've got no idea when that's going to be. Um, New tenancies created after that date will be assured tenancies by default, and all of these new rules will apply to those tenancies. You then have something called the extended application date, and that is the transitional provision which covers all tenancies that existed before the application date came into force. Now, again, we've got no idea when the extended application date is going to be. Um, For the Tenant Fees Act, there was a year transition. Uh, For the Deregulation Act, there was a three year transition. So we may be many years away from mm. uh, from all tenancies being converted into assured tenancies. We can only estimate at this stage. Um, I don't really want to estimate. I want to provide some certainty. Um, you see, yeah, those are the two key dates of which we know nothing about. Um, and the, the general mechanism is that if you have, an, you have the application date, if you have a tenancy that was in a fixed term before the application date, that goes periodic before the extended application date, it will become an assured tenancy at that point, and everything else will be covered by the extended application date. And and in terms of the the mechanism on which um, agents or landlords have to follow, is there any suggestion that there needs to be any work here? So um, to the point of of of, of sort of retrospectively um, uh, seeing a tenancies merge onto an assured tenancy, it, has the government suggested at any stage that letting agent landlords will have to communicate this with tenants because? In my mind, it, it's one thing it being law, but actually, you know, part of this is education. The other part is enforcement, which we'll also touch on later. Um, but our, our letting agents and landlords are going to have to notify their tenants, for example, that these things are happening. Is there a contractual change in writing that needs to take place here? There is a suggestion. So that there is um, section nine of the bill talks about a written statement of terms. And if anyone here has had anything to do with Wales over the last few years, they will know the terminology of a written statement of terms. Um that really, in my mind, just suggests a landlord providing a written tenancy agreement. Because, again, I'm talking to agents here. All of your agreements will be in writing, but not all ASTs are in writing. Uh, there's a little provision there saying that if it's not in writing, you've got to provide it by a certain point. But in terms of the information you're going to have to provide to the tenants about the transition, uh, the bill doesn't suggest any. Though I dare say there's going to be some equivalent. I mean, the amount of work and, and man hours that have gone into producing how to rent guides over the years, I dare say they're not going to throw that away. They'll probably adapt that and, and say this is something you have to provide in the future. I'm speculating slightly here. Mm. Uh, but yeah, nothing in the bill to suggest you'll need to let the tenants know. Though the general mantra of, of, of law in this country uh, is that anyone who's going to be affected by these rules and perhaps isn't in a position to attend or be notified of a Good Lord webinar to tell them what's going to change uh, will need to be notified some other way. So I would expect there to be something akin to the How to Rent Guide, which will need to be given to all tenants uh, when the, when this transition takes place. Sure, that would make sense. I think it'd be strange to, to, to make this kind of 
uh, transition and and not see tenants informed or, 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 or of the nature of that transition educate them and I think there's a benefit for all parties in in, in doing so. Um, let's just return back then, uh, moving away from from the ten- the tenancy change into section eight. Um, and I appreciate this. We've had quite a few questions actually already come in, um, so I am going to try best to blend these in. Like I said, we do have time at the end of the session, um, but. From a Section 8 perspective, of course, Section 8 exists at the moment. Section 21 is going. So some of the powers that were in Section or utilised via Section 21, um, they're trying to make Section 8 more robust in order to help support um, what landlords and tenants um, need um, and, and want out, out, out of the legislative change. Um, if, if, if I may, let's focus on arrears as, as the start of a 10 on Section 8, because, of course, uh, predominantly... Um, that section eight is being utilised at the moment to to evict tenants who, who are in arrears. The rules are changing around arrears, aren't they? And there's also a um, what could be suggested as a uh, a a new uh, provision to help landlords. Um, we can we can have our opinion on that in a minute. Where you know there's essentially a three strikes and you're out rule. But let, let's just, let's focus initially on the actual change to section eight. What's the suggestion here, Ryan? We'll, we'll ease ourselves into the new ground. Um, so uh, as a warm up, most agents will probably be familiar with Section 8 in the context of grounds 8, 10 and 11, the rent arrears grounds collectively. Um, currently, that's a two week notice period, but it is going to go up to a four week notice period. Um, at least, again, sorry, just to be clear here, this is obviously a proposal. Uh, we don't yet know what the final uh, rules are going to be with this. Um, the So aside from it changing from two weeks to four weeks, ground eight is also going to shift slightly. Um, Ground eight currently requires there to be two months for entry at the time you serve the notice and at the date of the eventual possession hearing. And as long as those two things are satisfied, then you'll get an order for possession. The it's been tweaked slightly to account for late payments of universal credit. some tenants may be relying on money coming in, the bureaucracy is slow, and that money may not have hit their account. Now I mentioned at the start, I deal with possession work, and I don't know how you can possibly anticipate what monies a tenant is likely to receive unless they communicate that to you. I don't think you can make an informed decision about that at the time you say serve a notice or even issue proceedings, Mm. because the key factor here is at the time of the possession hearing, are there any universal credit payments due to paid? If there are, deduct that or offset that against the rent arrears and then the court has to make a decision if it's below two months the court no longer has to make a possession order if it's above two months the court can still make the possession order but there's this massive uncertainty which doesn't currently exist um the court is only concerned at at, at the present time with what money is in the landlord's bank account how much does the the tenant owe right now it doesn't matter what money is going to be coming in in a few weeks time it's Mm. what's there right now so um and and this definitely feels like an area that um could be um for once a better phrase abused because it, it it the clarity there like you say is it so far anyway in, in this process hasn't been absolute to be able to give real frameworks around what the liability on the tenants are what the landlords are and the letting agents in, in the middle of that mix to be able to be sure that that action that, that action is going to be be prosperous for you know in terms of evicting the tenants if, if they are in arrears so i expect there to be some friction around this but i also I think it's worth noting you can see what they're trying to achieve here they're trying to say listen you know if, if a tenant is in arrears through no fault mm. of their own i.e the system has failed then they should not be evicted i I'm, you know, I, I probably agree with that of course yeah it's not it's not down to them that's very difficult for them to sit down and lose that lose their home no, that doesn't feel fair so i think the in theory what they're trying to achieve here is is broadly positive but the mechanics and the practice of this could be somewhat more challenging right yeah, I mean, I, I personally suspect this isn't something that's going to arise very often. Um, as I say, I deal with lots of possession cases. It very rarely ever comes down to the wire like this. I've not seen many cases that I can recall recently where a tenant has said, universal credit are due to pay me, and they haven't yet done so. That mm. hasn't tended to be the defence. So um, this maybe is a cause for worry, but at the same time, I'm not sure how many cases that's actually going to determine one way or the other. So maybe in that sense, we'll just see how it see how it pans out. Indeed, indeed. I'm going to cover a few questions in in quick, fast succession if I can, because they are, they're amounts going. I'm keen to to ensure people are getting getting the value out of today's session. Um, I'm going to start with Tom. Good morning, Tom. I hope you're well. Um, he ha- he asks, um, will any of the new laws be retrospective, Ryan? Uh, retrospective in the sense of let, let's say, for example, you've got a current tenancy agreement. And that tenancy agreement doesn't come to an end anytime soon. That will eventually be hit by the extended application date and will eventually convert to um, 
an assured tenancy. I don't I don't think that's the question he's asking, but I just want to be clear, there's nothing retrospective. No. He will be given lots of notice as to when the laws are going to come into force and lots of time to prepare for it too. So um, there's there's nothing in here that should catch you out. Fantastic. Ruth, hopefully we've asked you, answered your question around will new tenancies have to be issued? We don't believe they will be. We think there could be some kind of notification back to, to tenants, but again, that isn't confirmed uh, confirmed as yet. Um, somebody who hasn't left their name, um, nonetheless, good morning to you. Um, what is the definition um, of uh, an AST or an assured tenancy? Um, so really asking for the differences, I think, there between the two. I mean, the, the only difference really is Section 21. That is the only difference. Um, Everything else is pretty much exactly the same. You can still serve a Section 13 notice. You can still serve a Section 8 notice. Um, one Something that we haven't yet touched upon is um, the, the fact that they're doing away with fixed terms as part of this bill as well. Mm. Um, that isn't necessarily linked to an assured tenancy or an assured shorthold tenancy. But um, the idea is if you don't have a Section 21 notice, then and let's say everything else remains stable, then that tenancy can in theory just run forever um there wouldn't be anything that naturally brings it to an end and if a landlord wanted to bring it to an end they would need a good reason to to do that indeed um paul l good morning paul l um i thought the bill was in debate and not law is yes indeed it is uh, uh, hopefully we, we've been clear on that this is very much at the start of the process um and has, has some way to go and, and we do expect challenge both in the house of commons and the house of lords um I'm sure there's plenty of interested parties that will they'll want to have their view and their voice heard on, on some of the um, proposed changes. So, yes, very much, Paul. Uh, and this is this is not law as yet, just to confirm that. Um, uh, in terms of a few of the questions, let me make sure we're covering anything off that we can at this moment. Um, are company lets affected by the renters' reform bill? Uh, somebody who hasn't left their name again. Please do try to leave a name if you can. Um, good morning to you, uh, nonetheless. Um, company lets, Ryan. Um, do we expect there to be any change here? Uh, no. So um, Schedule 1 of the Housing Act 1988 sets out a big list of tenancies that cannot be assured tenancies. Um, and lets to companies are one of them. It, essentially, to create an assured tenancy or an assured shorthold tenancy, you need to be letting to an individual or individuals, not a, not a company. Fantastic. And final question for, for, for now, and we'll, we'll move on to, 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 to other areas of the webinar um, from Donna. Good morning, Donna. Uh, Donna asks, um, just would like to clarify what Ryan was suggesting about existing tenancies that expire following the application date. Is the thought landlords will not be able to agree a further fixed term and that the tenancy will automatically transition to the new assured tenancy as a periodic tenancy? Yep, uh, she's absolutely nailed that. That is exactly what the uh, what the idea is. So um, you you. So this uh, bill proposes that you will do away with fixed terms. You won't be able to create new fixed terms after the application date. For existing fixed terms that come to an end after the application date, it will simply become periodic and therefore an assured tenancy and all the new rules will apply at that point. Fantastic. We will come back to, to, to some more questions shortly and we'll try and again blend them in and try and answer them as part of the session. There are a few on there. Um, Sharif, um, good morning, Sharif. I hope you're well. Um, he asks about threats and opportunities. We are going to come on to some of those later in the session. Um, right. To Going back to Section 8, I just want to touch on the um, the particular part or suggestion around rent arrears. Um, I had a similar conversation with Sean Hooker last week for our immediate response on, on the podcast. Um, and, and if I may, Ryan, I'll, I'll explain to you how I've read the bill and you can then tell me I'm wrong. Uh, maybe and then explain it properly to the to the to the uh, invitees today. Um, so there is um, what I've, I've called it a three strikes in your rule, uh, out rule almost being being suggested around arrears, and it's, it suggests as I read it that um, if you are in two months arrears on three separate occasions within a three year period, um, that essentially would give you uh, would, give, would give power to accelerated possession. And the way I've read that, Ryan, uh, and I may be mistaken, which is why this, this session is helpful for us all. The way I've read that is if you're two months in arrears um, going into January, let's say, um, you pay January. So I'm still two months in arrears. I pay February. I'm still two months in arrears. I pay March. I'm still two months in arrears. So I'm not making up the, the arrears that I owe. That mm. under the wording as I've read it, that would be classed as three separate occasions under the, in the tenancy. I'm in two months in arrears. That would then essentially unlock that provision and under, under the bill am i understanding that right or is the is the meaning around two months arrears three separate occasions that has to have time in between it i just wonder if there's any clarification in your mind on that there is a verbatim clarification in the legislation if you'd like me to just read it out and then i can interpret what that what that means Indeed. um so um so the legislation talks about um separate at least three separate occasions 
And then it goes on to say, for the purposes of this ground, occasions are separate. If in between those occasions, the amount of unpaid rent reduced to below the amount mentioned, and it goes into some legal jargon, but it essentially says two months. Um, so if you've got your scenario where they, they owe two months rent, if they reduce it to below two months rent, then that will trigger a new occasion next time they go over two months rent. Does that help clarify so, things? Yeah. So just to be clear, then a tenant could be in two months or two months arrears, month after month after month after month. What we need is a diagram, I think. Um, yeah. So if you just can just imagine this red line across the middle of the screen, which is two months rent arrears, they owe two months, they go up. That is an occasion. They pay it, they go down to one month and then another month's rent falls due. It goes up again. That's a second occasion. Yeah. So they could be, like you say, it can come sequentially because they've produced yeah. it in the interim. Um, if it was just one big block, then they would essentially be going two months into entries, three months into entries, four months into entries. That's one occasion for the purposes of this ground. But then mm. they also need to be mindful that ground eight applies too. Indeed. So between ground yeah. eight and ground eight A, there is um, there is a way of penalising tenants who are tiptoeing around that figure um, for for a long period of time. And not to mention these are three separate occasions over three years. That's a really big window. Like I, I, that's mm. probably one of the biggest surprises I I thought from this. Um, a lot can happen in three years. Um, some people live quite chaotic and unpredictable lives, and uh, let's say through no fault of their own, um, they may end find themselves tipping over into two months or into years on three occasions over those three years. Um, mm. And once you're in that, uh, once you're in that space, it really is a checkmate. Uh, I think you use the expression of accelerated possession. I think this is probably the closest equivalent to Section Twenty One because once mm. they're in that, they can't get out of it. They have been in arrears three times over three years if a landlord served a section eight notice on those grounds he would get possession and that would be that mm. um that's if, if if i'm going to see or if i'm going to anticipate this being fleshed out through parliament and the house of lords i think the three-year window is probably the thing that's going to change um just because i can see a lot of um a lot of people having a problem with the with, with the breadth of um of, of that time frame yeah, agreed, and and I think we expect we expect pressure on, on that element and others, right, going through the house uh, or both houses, um, because there's I think there's definitely been a um, I think the government's definitely been in a more listening mode in 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 the more recent months around landlords um, and you know the the level of incentivization or, or opposite in this bill, um, and that's been clear from conversations that we've we've, we've held with Dealock and also some of the commentary coming out of the government. I think the government do understand broadly that. You know, it takes both parties to, to operate a good sector. And um, yeah, I would be I'd be surprised if that doesn't get further pressure. Um looking at other um uh, looking at other mechanisms to, to to get properties back, of course, we're talking about arrears there from a section eight perspective. Um one of the um biggest um uh sort of headline grammars as we discussed with section 21. I'm going to return to that, but there is a um, there is another question that comes off the back of that, of course, because uh, currently, if you want your property back for whatever reason, you can serve a Section 21. The legislation is now defining reasons as to why you can get your property back, aren't they? And especially um, not only defining, but also giving time restrictions around that kind of action. And as I understand it, Ryan, um, the first six months, the tenants are protected from um, a, a notice for, for causes like wanting to sell the property or family moving in. Um, but after that, um, it's fair game. Can you talk us through exactly what the bill's proposing in this area? Yeah, so agents will be familiar that uh, you can't serve a Section 21 notice in the first four months of an AST currently. Uh, and therefore, that means a notice can't expire until month six. Um, this has been expanded upon slightly. And, and you'll recall that part of the government's mantra here is to do away with no-fault evictions. But Grounds 1 and Ground 1A are no-fault evictions. Um, they are Section 21s for a different for a different name, as far as I'm concerned, because it doesn't relate to the tenant's behaviour at all. It relates to the landlord's intentions. Um, it's not the tenant's fault if a landlord wants to sell the property. Uh, I mean, it may be in certain circumstances, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so Grounds 1 and Ground A, which, like I say, are no-fault notices, uh, both have the stipulation they cannot be served, um, or sorry, cannot expire earlier than month six of a tenancy agreement. And that roughly corresponds to the current restrictions on section 21 notices uh, did you want me to go into those grounds while while i'm here yeah i think i think it'd be helpful 
Yeah. So ground one currently, and, and I, this is the biggest change, I think. Ground one currently, if you want to rely on it, uh, requires the landlord to have given the, the tenant a notice that they intend to rely on ground one uh, before the tenancy begins. Now, a lot of agents just stick ground one notices in all the tenancy agreements and just don't don't think about it. But in theory, that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to serve a notice beforehand. That has been done away with here. So a landlord can just serve the ground one notice. Now, ground one is when the landlord or a member of the landlord's family intends to move into the property to occupy it. Um, there is a list of landlord's family for the purposes of this, but you basically have children, partner, uh, parents, grandparents, grandchildren, and you also have uh, the your partner's parents, children, grandparents, grandchildren uh, to correspond to. So, but so long as the landlord um, serves a notice and, and intends to move someone else in, then they can serve a notice on ground one, two month notice, and. If a tenant doesn't leave, then um, then land can start a possession claim just as they mm-hmm. just as they currently can. It's not um it's not a very popular ground presently. The reason being is that you would just use Section Twenty One, use the accelerator process if that's mm-hmm. genuinely your intention. But um, this is the best you'll have in the in the new era when it arrives. So, so you should expect actually, if there were any resistance to that, the in, in letting agents and landlords' minds you know they'll be thinking of the two months but in reality like a lot of other things it, it could well be longer than that before the property is retained back because if the tenant's non-compliant then they're gonna to have to go through the appropriate channels in order to get the property back in the usual way i'd imagine yeah absolutely uh, this this was i think this was part of the white paper was that the government was mm. looking at uh better funding c- the courts and alternatives to court processes i didn't see this flashed out at all in the in the uh in the bill by the way uh but any agent who's had the displeasure of uh, going through the court system presently will know that at best, you're probably looking at a three month turnaround from issuing the claim to getting an eviction date. And at that's best. if you hap- if, if you are lucky <laughs> enough to live next to some of the quickest courts in the country. Indeed. Um, I want to shout out Derby County Court, by the way, if you live near Derby County Court, they are, in my opinion, the quickest court in the country. If your property is in East London, you are probably looking at about an eight month to 10 month turnaround from yeah. issuing proceedings to getting an eviction date. Yeah, so, we're seeing, um, we're seeing cases two, two months, months in those Two months locations. as if they comply, but you can never you can never guarantee that they will comply. I like the idea of doing a quarterly Ryan's favourite court um, and having a, having a top of the pops uh, episode of this, but that's maybe we'll ponder that for another day. Um, uh, now, it could be suggested, um, uh, and, and, and to be fair, um, the bill has been scrutinised from all angles, which is the right thing to do. That's exactly the point of doing it in this, this manner. But it could be suggested um, prior to the bill being released that actually this was an easy out for landlords. They could just say, hey, I'm going to sell the property, and they don't go and sell the property. We will come on to enforcement on a wider, um, as a wider sort of conversational point shortly, but particularly um, enforcement around this. There are mechanisms, aren't there, um, that are giving local authorities power um, in order to um, actually find landlords if they if they abuse um, th- this legislative change. Yeah, now this this applies to ground 1A as well. I did want to talk about this a little bit because it ties into some other things that I'm going to mention later on. Both of these grounds, more or less as written, exist in Scotland at the moment. And uh, for reading Shelter's re- discussions and blogs on it, um, it's open to abuse. There is uh, There are mechanisms uh, which will allow local authorities to issue fines and convict people. So you have um, you have five thousand pound fines and thirty thousand pound fines if there's a conviction. Um, and there's also uh, a mechanism whereby if you if a local authority believe you serve this notice incorrectly, or let let's say so you never intended or the land never intended to actually live in the property, then you could be fined for even serving the notice. What I am surprised to see or not see is that there is no incentive for the tenant um, in these scenarios. So um, agents would already be well aware of uh, the the deposit counterclaim, up to three Mm. times the value of the deposit if if it's not dealt with correctly. That incentivizes the tenant to to report these things and enforce their rights. Um, Similarly, you have rent repayment orders uh, for breaches of licensing conditions and breaches of uh, improvement notices that incentivizes the tenant to, to, um, to, to be on guard for these things. If a tenant is given a notice on ground one or ground 1A um, and they leave the property, they don't have any incentive to go back and check whether or not the landlord actually put that property on the market for sale or have moved their family members in there. So how would the local authority actually find out if if the tenants aren't going to report it or they have no reason to report it? 
they're not going to find out. Um, and this is why it's, it's open for abuse in, in, in Scotland, is it's just there is a gap between local authorities' ability to enforce these rules. Um, and the, the obvious answer to that, in my view, is to incentivise the tenant to report them um, as they've done with deposit breaches and as they've done with licensing breaches. Mm. Um, I hopefully that answers uh, a couple of people's questions. Um, we had quite a few coming in there around the enforcement of that piece, um, Amy um uh laura for example um hopefully that answers your questions um when it comes to to enforcement we will revisit enforcement as a, as a wider conversation point towards the end of the webinar um okay so um we've got section 21 being abolished we've boxed that off uh, we've got changes from a, a tenancy perspective from ast to assured tenancies uh, we've got in, in, in more uh empowered section eight and a changing grounds there for for the landlords to get their properties back um, you, you note there in terms of the enforcement and you know there being gaps in that, um, one could argue that that actually is the direction of travel for the property portal. Um, and actually once the property portal is established and, 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 and you know, um, essentially gets out there, over time you start to link things like um, uh, unique property reference numbers, which will be the, 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 the single identifier for your property moving forwards. Um, and you start linking those to, to names of landlords on the landlord register, which we'll, I'm going to ask you a question about landlord register shortly. And then you start linking that maybe to the HMRC, for example. You can see how the web actually then starts to work um, to actually give a level of enforcement that maybe isn't um, predicated by tenant feedback or them raising their hand. So I, I think you're right to say there's, there's definitely a, a gap there. I wonder, though, fast forward five, 10 years, whether that gap will be closed through through the property portal. And that leads me to my next question. Um, can you talk us through what they're suggesting from a property portal and landlord register perspective? Because at the moment, of course, landlords don't have to do anything like this. Um, that is changing as part of this bill. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there, there are um, there are two other grounds I did want to cover. So I'll, we'll go back sure. to that afterwards. You, your segue was so elegant. I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> So the property portal, this is, um, I, I alluded to this at the start, that we have various different timeframes for things. Um, and the property portal is one of those things where we don't have any idea really about what it's going to look like. Um, the government has, has well, the way the government has phrased it is that the Secretary of State can lay down regulations in the future. What that means is they're kicking the can down the road. They haven't been able to flesh it out in this, um, this bit of legislation. And if I'm sceptical or, or cynical about it, um, it's because they don't want it scrutinised in the same way that this this bill will be. Um, the the technical expression for it is a uh, Henry VIII power, um, and what that means is is that the government can introduce something by way of a statutory instrument, because the minister for that department thinks it's a good idea to 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 enact change. This bill is just giving them the right to do that later and down the line. And the statutory instrument will not be scrutinised through Parliament or through the House of Lords as as it presently is or as this bill, as this bill is. Mm. Um, so in terms of what we know about it, um, not that much. We have uh, we have the, the database. Uh, Ollie, you referred to a unique signifier code. So when the landlord registers, they'll be given a code. When the property is uploaded, that will be given a code. And then on property marketing websites, both those codes will be there. I do wonder how they're going to do that from a GDPR point of view, because I don't think many landlords will be particularly happy with their details being put on, um, say, Rightmove, for example, when the, when the property is being marketed. Um, though... Maybe that's just something for I the, think, for the text. Well, I, I think it will sit in the background. I think the, the what will be displayed, as, as per my understanding at least, is the unique uh, the UPRN, so unique property reference number, will be the will be displayed. That will then link into the landlord database, but that will be protected. So it, it's a way of it's a way of being able to identify and track. But uh, you know, f- from a public perspective, clearly only identified every property has a unique property reference number already, uh, which is actually being utilised already by utility companies, for example, and other businesses. And, you know, we should expect, um, and you should expect as letting agents and landlords to see more about this from suppliers like ourselves and others um, as a good way to link everything around the property. So I, th- I think they are, aware, they're very much aware from the conversations we've been party to, Ryan, that, that that becomes a potential problem in terms of exposure. It's no different to the, um, you know, the landlord's name and address being featured on a tenancy room, for example. You know, and plenty of people have concerns around that, rightly so. Um, so I think there's a mechanism there that maybe they can they they, they can deliver there, Ryan, to, to to answer that question. Yeah, good. No, that's fine. And like I say, I I, I treasure my ignorance on some of these technical solutions, but uh, I, I'll, I'll let the um, I'll let the the tech geeks figure it out. <laughs> Um, you wanted just two grounds, sorry, and and my um, untimely segue cut you off. 
So what we've got is ground one uh, A. This is a new ground, and I did allude to it earlier. This is the one where if a landlord intends to sell the property, they can serve a notice. Now, I was surprised at how cavalier the wording is here. So it is genuinely as simple as the landlord intends to sell the property. It doesn't need to be on the market. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to have a sale sign outside of it. It doesn't need to have a sale. Um, it just needs to be an intention to sell. And I wanted to um, frame that in the context of, of a law that already exists, which is Section 34 of the Deregulation Act. Now, this applies to um, in the context of uh, retaliatory eviction um, and circumstances where retaliatory eviction won't apply. And Section 34 uses the terminology of the property is genuinely on the market for sale. So compare genuinely on the market for sale mm -hmm. to intend to sell. But that, the government could use stricter wording if they wanted to. And indeed, a mechanism already exists whereby genuine the market for sale means you're not selling it for uh, a million pounds when you know you're never going to get that. You're not selling it to a friend or a business partner. There's all kinds of structure in place to support this, but they haven't put any of that structure in place here. Now, either that's because they don't want to or they just simply haven't thought that it's open to abuse. But that seems naive in the extreme. This is this one is going to get abused. Um, there is. Do you think on that, Ryan, just given that, that there is a there is a structural process that exists already in law that could that could clearly you know clean this up very quickly. Do you think this is a nod towards actually giving landlords somewhat more flexibility, uh, somewhat a halfway house from Section Twenty One to actually having really de really well defined legislative change? Or am I reading too much into that? And this is just a, a slip a slip of phraseology, and we'll get cleaned up as part of the the bill process. If, if you look at how well they've defined other parts of this bill, like I say, there's a mm. whole bit in here which is more or less indecipherable, which relates to transitioning uh, rental periods from one month, from over one month into one month. And there's a whole formula. It, it's really complex and technical. I don't believe for a second they didn't intend to put this wording in here yeah. as simple as it is they they intended for that to happen um and we'll see whether or not it makes it through parliament as it is because i dare say some some mps are going to have a problem with something as simple as an intention to sell it cross it crossed for landlord's mind once that they might want to sell the property so they can so they can serve this note well it, it, if mps don't have a problem with it I, I imagine the courts will because it's very difficult in terms of how they're going to manage that right and i expect there's going to be further kickbacks so as much as it might feel advantageous for for, for some landlords and litigators to have such broad wording um it's fair to point out that can cause further problems um down the road right so actually clarity is is more helpful uh, in some respects than having something that is open-ended and we you know waiting for president's law to kind of show its show its hand um um, just talking about um, uh, so the, the further changes. I'm conscious of time. I mean, there's we could probably do three or four sessions on this. We may well do, um, depending on on, on your feedback um, from, from the attendees here today. Um, just talking about some further changes. Rent increases. Um, we've had a few questions on, um, and um, the rent increase process is now being more fortified rather than delivered. It's in the section 13 process. What I'm referring to that exists already, right? But that's essentially going to be mandated as part of the bill that that is the only way that you can increase the tenant's rent can you talk us through what that process is and what the suggestive um suggested sort of effects of that are to both tenant and landlord yep fine um so presently there's three ways to increase the rent you do have section 13 notices and just to recap the section 13 notice you can only serve in the periodic contract um you can't serve one within 12 months of the last section 13 notice um and presently it has a one month notice period but that is going to go up to two months when this when this comes into force the other two mechanisms are through rent increase clauses which uh, a lot of agents just have as part of their standard package the, the rent goes up by three to eight percent uh, once a year and then you also have just the ability of the landlord and tenant to negotiate rent increase between themselves so by consent essentially um the rule change does away with rent increase clauses entirely and the ability for the tenant to consent to a rent increase can only happen after a section 13 notice has been served and even then the amount consented to can only be less than the amount on the section 13 notice so that does mean for most for most purposes you're going to have a section 13 notice being served and a tenant can as as they currently can uh, apply to the property tribunal for them to assess a fair rent and then the the tribunal will set the rent for the property and and the um the fair rent piece that 
could arguably work two ways, right? So uh, we, we're yet to be very clear on what the barometer of fair rent is, um, but that will, I'm sure, be be evident in time. But one could suggest that if a tenant isn't happy with the £20 a month as being increased because they feel particularly spiky about it, they took a, an appeal in and the market rent actually, if you look at more recent times, has increased by 15, 20%, for example. The, the fair, as I understand it, that that process could indeed point out and actually mandate that the, no, the fair rental of this property is, is Y, not X. Um, it, it, it can work both ways for landlord and tenants, I presume. It's, it's not just about decreasing a rent increase that is actually fair. Yeah, the, the tribunal would need very good reason to set it higher. But you're quite right. The market rent has varied wildly, uh, well, mm. in an upwards trajectory over yeah. the last few years, um, with more landlords maybe leaving the market as a result of legislation like this. You can see supply going down, therefore rents going higher. Um, I don't see any reason for a landlord to undersell the value of the property on a Section 13 notice. So if you were to, let's say the market rent for a property is £1,500. If a landlord serves a Section 13 notice at £1,800, the worst case scenario there is that the, the tribunal is going to set the rent at 1500 which is what it's truly worth. Um, the best case scenario is the tenant doesn't do a thing about it, unlikely. Um, and um, yeah, like I say, it, it's only in rare circumstances that the tribunal would allow um, a rent to be set higher than the Section 13 notice. Therefore, I would say if you think, or if an animal thinks a tenant is going to appeal a Section 13 notice anyway, you may as well give yourself a bit of breathing room and serve a notice higher than the market value. Um, and that gives the tribunal scope to set it as what it actually is, rather than having their hands bound because you tried to do too modest of a rent increase. And what what's the framework here for actually delivering um, a a timely answer in those cases? Because I recognise what you're saying in terms of you know setting setting those limits at a higher level and essentially hoping for the best. And and if the system works, then great. If it doesn't, then we benefit from higher rent. Um, there's a level of abuse in that process in terms, of, in terms of what it was there to do and what it's actually delivering. I'd be conscious though that you look at um, you look at the amount of properties that, that, that this, this this legislative change affects. Rent increases will be happening happening every twelve months as per the um, legislation. Mm-hmm. Are they really going to be able to manage the mass of appeals that they're surely going to receive if tenants are educated? Because mm. any rent increase is going to feel like, I mean, there's no downside for the tenant here, right? They might as well appeal it. Absolutely. It's only their time. There's no cost implication at the moment to tenants. Yeah, completely agree. So presently, the property tribunal is in a fairly good condition, I'd say, um, certainly when you compare it to the county court system. These appeals generally get sorted out within, within two to three months. Um, so you have resolution in a fairly swift manner. Um yeah, I, I can only see timescales going down from here, like you say, because now this is the only mechanism to increase the rent. Um, there is nothing, there's no alternative. And again, the tenant is heavily incentivized to appeal a Section 13 notice because why not? Mm. Sorry, and you said they're going down. Did you mean you can only see timescales going up? Sorry. Um, Absolutely. So unless there's greater funding. Um, yes. Which I don't expect. Uh, the, the the tribunal system is also somewhat limited because uh, the, when you issue a claim in court, you have to pay a fee, and tribunals um, either don't charge a fee at all, or they charge a, a minimal fee, um, which is then awarded to well, the loser essentially is, is made to pay. Um, so the tenant may as well um, appeal everything that comes in because they lose nothing; they exactly. potentially gain something. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, that- the other the other thing was um is as we mentioned earlier about tenants' knowledge because I can see plenty of tenants being completely unaware of their rights in regards to this um and I would expect many landlords to be proposing rent increases to tenants and they just agree to it not knowing that they that that isn't necessarily the right way of of going about it um tenant knowledge is going to be really important here in terms of making sure that the system isn't abused or or, or, or circumnavigated indeed um. I'm conscious of time and also conscious we've got another another load of slides. Um, Ryan, I think we should continue on this, this vein. There's lots of questions coming in that I want to cover. Um, so I'm going to suggest, um, if I may, that the, the secondary part of, of, of this webinar forms a part two, actually, that we'll, we'll, we'll reschedule um, and we'll cover the 
um, cover these sort of threats and opportunities from a legal perspective, uh, but also sort of making the comparisons against the con- other countries like Scotland and Wales um, and going into a bit more of a deep dive uh, on some of these points. Arguably as well, you know, future future proofing this, you know, within time, hopefully we get even more information from this process and we can give you more information too. Um, but this is, this is this is fascinating stuff and, and clearly from the questions coming in, really helpful. So thank you so much. I, I'm going to fire a few questions at you and we've had a couple. Uh, so forgive me not calling your name out this morning, but good morning to you all. A couple of rounds um, rent in advance because of course in the confines of a fixed term contract rent in advance is relatively simple uh, as a concept um, that somewhat changes when you have a an assured tenancy that is you know month after month after month where do you see rent in advance heading and this is probably less legal more opinion maybe because um you know ultimately if the tenants have to pay a certain amount up front then and their allowance have to accept it that's their choice somewhat um where do you see rent in advance sitting moving forwards once this bill is introduced I don't think there's a problem with rent in advance um, because it, it, so this is the idea that if you have a 12 month tenancy, they pay the last well, two months of the rent. Um, or no, or, they, or, or they, no, they could pay if, if let, let's say, for example, you've got a tenant who, um, for whatever reason, can't meet the the referencing demand set. Um, and the, the normal mechanism there would be to say, OK, we'll give you a six month contract and you pay six months rent up front or we'll give you a 12 month contract. You pay 12 months rent up front. Um, you know, with the removal of the fixed term, there is there anything stopping from a, a legislative perspective in in agents asking for rental payments up front of a agreed amount, uh, seven months, nine months, twelve? Months, it doesn't really matter, I suppose. It, it has to be an amount. I think there's scope to, to to get around the rules. So there is something in this um, which basically says you can't have a rental period of more than a month. Um, so if you're taking, say, six months rent in advance, which I think is quite standard if if someone fails yeah. referencing, you that I I don't think it's a problem because you are still t- you're essentially taking six individual payments of one month. You're not asking for six months, if you see what I mean. I think that it, it, we may need to think about this a little bit more. But um, the law the law will will say that you can't take more than a monthly rental period. So you just happen to be taking six months. Then they're they're in credit. There's nothing wrong with a, with a tenant being in credit. So yeah, I, I think I think with some clever wording, it could be got around in its current state. Um, the the scenario I envisioned was was the idea of a float. So some agents take two months, which then gets allocated towards the last two months um, mm-hmm. rent on the property. That could still work here because a tenant's notice is going to be two months. So when a tenant serves their notice to quit, essentially the rent that they've already paid gets allocated to the last two months rent. So that, that could work too. Um, Cause again, there is no problem with a tenant being in credit, which is effectively what they, what they are. Yeah. Okay. I, I think definitely there needs to be, um, you know, we're, we're less than a week in uh, to the bill being released and it's not law yet at all. And there definitely needs to be more thinking from a electing agent perspective. And, and, you know, we can support on this around what rent in advance looks like, because, um, I imagine it's going to be quite hard to argue to a tenant that I need six months or I need 12 months when it's a month by month tenancy. Um, but also they will want access to the property. So, um, you know, the, there is a side effect to some of this stuff that, of course, marginalizes um, certain cohorts of tenants in, in, in this space. And actually, you could argue that as an example of where at the moment they have you know access to a property where landlords have confidence because they have a fixed term contract. Both parties can agree that it's six months, for example, up front. You could argue this is making that more difficult, but um, more thought needed, uh, I think, there. But uh, thank you to all of you who asked that question. I think it's a really pertinent one. Um, another pertinent um, question around the legislative change, uh, Ryan, is students. Um, because um, from a student perspective, um, some of this legislation will apply to them. Some of it won't. And it predominantly comes down to the purpose in which, as I understand it, the property was built. Um, can you talk us through how this this affects students? Um, so I might need to just clarify that for a second, because um, most student bodies tend to not want students to be treated any differently to anyone else. And we had this big kerfuffle in Wales where uh, they introduced um, a succession process. So basically someone died, then someone who lived with them could succeed or inherit Mm. their tenancy. Um, And people think, well, what about students? Um, As rare as it is for that to occur, it still applies. And as far as I as far as I could see on my reading, um, there wasn't any exceptions for for students. There is um, there is presently um, 
a, a ground for uh, student accommodation, so mm. a Section 8 ground, but that would only apply if you were yourself an educational establishment. So, for example, a university, um, a landlord letting to students wouldn't be able to utilise that ground. And I don't think there's any exceptions to this legislation no. for students. And that's, and that's the crux of it, I think, for a lot of student agencies and uh, at the moment, because actually, by definition, the, the legisl legislation makes their jobs extremely hard to both future plan and give a surety to tenants. And the side effects of this, um, I think, will be be pretty big. Um, we know that, you know, through, through, the, through the journey it's taken us to get to this stage, Ben Beadle, for example, at NOLA, uh, Property Mark, um, have all um, sort of campaigned around some clarity of what happens to the, the student's side of the PRS in light of the legislative change. It doesn't seem like that was listened to um, or actions. I would expect maybe this to be an area that's challenged too, um, because actually students do uh, and can benefit more so from a fixed term, uh, for example, rather than a, a short tenancy. The main reason for that is because uh, once a fixed term comes to end, the students can just leave. Um, how many students with the best will in the world are going to remember to give two months notice? Well, indeed. Um, well, well, yes, but also then it, the, the, there's other implications there in terms of how they can plan. Um, I think it, I think it's fraught with with, with challenge uh, from a student perspective. Um, keen, keen to hear uh, uh, student uh, letting agents' thoughts on this. It, it appears from from the questions um, that, that that maybe that that fear is is quite real. Um, looking through through the questions, we've had we've had literally hundreds of questions. Um, so I apologise if, if if I can't answer as I'm trying to answer as many and mass as we can um to uh, to ensure that it gains much value and again we will do another session on this given given the amounts of question we've got here and then and how much actually we, we we need to go through um so um hopefully stephanie that's answered your question around students in terms of exemptions um andy can i download the audit we will be sending a recording of this out to everybody that's partaken or indeed registered for it um uh louise asks will you be able to issue a section 13 at any point uh, and the frequency during the new uh, short tenancy. And I think, Ryan, you said um, it's once every 12 months. Is there a frequency? Is, is that aligned with the calendar month or the calendar date, sorry, the start date of the tenancy? Or can it be at any point in that first 12 months? Um, there, There is a wording for every 12 months that I don't have to hand, I'm afraid. Um, it's it's typically calendar month. Uh, but um, if, if you leave that with me, I can certainly find the answer out. That would be great. We'll we'll take that as a um, as a confirmation point in the in the follow up webinar um, on that one. Um, it would make sense, I suppose, if it was you know twelve months from the start date of tenancy, and then it's twelve months concurrently from there. But um, these things sometimes don't make sense. Um, in terms of the amount of increases, Lisa asks. Good morning, Lisa. Um, will there be a certain percentage set the rents can be increased by? I think you covered that off in terms of saying the market value. So um, one would argue that it becomes more important for landlords and agents to be very aware of what the market's doing to inform what applicable rent increases could could be um could be passed through yep absolutely agree so if the terminology is market rate and that is fine you're not limited to a, to a specific percentage if the rents have increased by 20 percent, that's how much um you can serve your section 13 notice for and uh francesca asks um that, do the tenants have to pay the new increase in the meantime whilst they're waiting for that appeal to take place i guess the answer is no it, it would be enforceable post the appeal um would be my guess yes those it does sometimes get backdated uh, it does. Okay. Um, what what on what, what sort of cases would that be? Um, I think it's just broad discretion, really. But okay. yeah, so, so there, there there wouldn't be any circumstances where the tenant is made to pay the higher rent um, whilst the appeal is taking place. But there might be circumstances where the um, where the tenant is made to to backdate the payments that would have been made if they hadn't contested it. I think I think it really comes down to reasonableness. So mm. uh, you said earlier about a 20, what if the rent went up by £20? If that was a very reasonable rent increase and was hadn't appealed it, then they might be asked to backdate it. Sure. Okay. Um, and um, sticking with uh, rent increases, I've just lost the question. So apologies. I'm going to try and get with that. Uh, so we've covered the percentage one. That was Lisa's question. Thank you for that. Um, and we've covered the backdated question as well. Um, in terms of the uh, Section 8, uh, Joe asks, could you serve a Section 8 on a tenant if they do not agree to a fair rent increase at market value? I think this this is kind of why the rules are here, right? This is designed to try and not – well, one of, the, one of the focuses of the government was to try and uh, support tenants not have reactionary notices served against them. Yeah, so um, I, I agree. There is no specific notice where if you've served a Section 13 notice and the tenant doesn't agree to it, that you could serve a Section 8 notice to evict them. Um, like I say, you do have the option of Ground 1 and Ground A if they happen to apply, yeah. uh, but they might not. 
And if they don't, then there's nothing else. Sure. Um, and uh, one or two more, uh, if, if we may. Markella, good morning, Markella. Um, ask, can we touch on antisocial behaviour? I think this is, this is, this is a good point because we, we haven't really focused too heavily on antisocial behaviour. There are provisions for antisocial behaviour in the in the bill, aren't there? That are giving more uh, more powers to landlords and letting agents. This was actually one of the the damp squibs. I thought there weren't really many changes. So the terminology change is um, so currently to serve a ground. 14 notice. So ground 14 is nuisance to neighbours or the landlord or to landlord's agents, basically nuisance to to, to everybody and and antisocial behaviour covers that. Um, The terminology changed from behaviour likely to cause a nuisance to being capable of causing a nuisance. But the thing about ground 14 is it's a discretionary ground for possession. So the court has to be persuaded that even if they were causing a nuisance, um, that it's such a serious breach of the agreement and, and they're causing such a nuisance to everybody else, that they should be um, evicted from the property. I don't think the wording of the ground changes the argument or the, the thought process of the judge when considering whether or not to make someone homeless on these grounds. Mm. Either you've got someone who is causing a major nuisance, in which case they would be evicted regardless of the of the wording change, or you have someone who isn't really causing that much of a nuisance, in which case the wording change doesn't assist them. I don't think this is this is much of anything, to be honest. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I appreciate we're already ever running. Uh, we've got quite a few questions um, coming in uh, from uh, a number of people, um, Sharif um, included, um, there around uh, insurance policies um, and particularly our rent and, uh, and legal expense insurance policy. Um, we're working with uh, with our partners, um, uh, DAS, to to ensure that we obviously provide a, a robust solution. Um, we don't expect that to be be overly challenging, um, and you know, ultimately, um, I would argue um, that. The, the rent and legal provision here is 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 more more helpful today than ever before and becomes more and more helpful as as it becomes a more challenging space to to maybe get your property back um and becomes definitely a space where landlords on their own may may find it difficult to navigate so yes from a good law perspective we will be um aligning um uh, with, 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 with 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 this bill um to ensure that we can fulfill um that level of service um um, Ollie, if, if I could just interject quickly. Of Sorry. Um, I found out the answer to that section 13 question. I've got the bill yeah. open in another tab. Um, this is something new. So previously, oh, sorry, I should say currently, it's a tribunal's discretion whether or not they want to backdate it. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a new bit being introduced here, which talks about the uh, rent being payable once once it's been determined by the tribunal as being the period set out in the section 13 notice, unless it seems to the tribunal that the tenant will suffer uh, undue hardship is the mm. terminology used. Okay. So if we're talking about a minor rent increase, then it's probably going to be fine. If it's quite a lot of money and the tenant circumstances need to be factored into that, then um, it, it may not be backdated. Thank you very much for clarifying that in, in such a timely manner. Um, we are out of time. and um, We've not covered uh, the um, the changes from a pet perspective. <laughs> um, I think we've we've not covered um, uh, many elements, actually. I'm not going to list them all because there's quite a few we haven't covered. Uh, we're probably on page four, uh, maybe, of the 89 schedule. Um, but but really, I, I, I hope that's been been beneficial to everybody joining. Um, we will book in another session um, from a, a legal standpoint. Ryan, it'd be, it'd be fantastic if you could make that, but we'll try and align diaries. Um, and we will um, invite all of the people attended today back in to finish this session and do part two as it were this is the uh the, the champions league semi-final second leg maybe um that we need to book in we are here with you every step of the way to try and explain uh, the nuanced differences between the things that are being suggested um try and clarify some of the more um more scary elements of it even to ryan's point even in his professional mindset some of this is extremely complicated which gives me no hope whatsoever but we will return hopefully for a second session to, to give you more guidance but i am conscious that this is people's mornings and and you're all busy people so on that note Thank you so much for your time, Ryan. Uh, We'll hopefully be online again uh, shortly. And thank you to the thousands of people that joined this morning. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic week. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ollie.